Is it all right if we begin with the game? Let's begin with the game. We're in deep fake, and uh, I want you to look at the pictures up here and see if you can decide which one is a fake and which one is real, okay? So let's go to the first picture here. Uh, which is the real <laughs> Pastor Charlie? You got it in your head? Okay, let's, show, let's do the real Pastor Charlie. Which one's the real? Okay. How many of you got that right? Let me see the show. How many of you faked out? Um, who, who is that? Is that Dawson or Brad Pitt? I don't know. Okay, next one. Deep fake. See if you can spot the real uh, headmaster of our school, Mr. Feathers, Dylan Feathers. You got it? Okay, which one is the real Dylan Feathers? Okay, that was, that was a little easy there. Next one, deep fake. See if you can spot the real Jill Whitlow. Don't be tricked on this one. You got it? Which one is the real Jill Whitlow? Okay, how many got 100%? Let me see your hands. You weren't faked out. Um, you know, we begin every week um, with this thought, you know, we, in this age with AI and all kinds of things, we can be faked in a, in a Zoom or, or watching a video or a picture. Um, that's one thing, even faked out of our money. But what happens when we experience a deep fake spiritually in our, in our walk with God? And so we're in this series on the Holy Spirit experiencing the real in a world of fake. You got your notes here. I want to talk to you about three reals. Everyone say real. Three real experiences of the Spirit of God, in other words, of the power. When we, t when we talk about the Spirit of God, we're talking about the power and the strength of God. Three real experiences of the strength and the power of God that everybody in this room can experience if you want to, can experience if you want to, so we can live our best lives that God wants us to live. Number one, the first experience, this is a real encounter with the Spirit of God. The first one available for everybody in here, is salvation. Salvation. We're talking about encountering the Spirit of God. There are many words uh, for salvation in Scripture, but we're just going to look at two, and we're going to go to Ephesians chapter uh, 2 and verse 1 and see if you can pick up the words. The first little paragraph is a description of our lives before Christ, okay? And any, for those who are new, anytime scripture's up there, I want you to read it out loud with me. Ephesians 2, 1. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Everybody say dead. So he's going to describe our life before Christ came. Once at one time, you were dead because of your disobedience and many sins. Let's keep going. You used to live in sin just like, come on, say that phrase again, just like the rest of the world obeying the devil. Who in the world is the devil? Let's keep reading. The commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. You know, just, just pause right there. Keep the scripture up there. Uh, there may be something more to it than, uh, than your own uh, willingness to, to not turn back to God. If we take Scripture seriously, it says there's a spirit at work. By the way, God's spirit is not the only spirit. That's why we're talking, come on, everybody say deep faith. There are, there are other spirits out there, but his spirit is working in the hearts of those who refuse to turn back to God. Well, I thought I was just doing it on my own. There might be something else involved there. His spirit is, is at work. Now, let's go to verse 3. All of us used to live that, come on, say all of us. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's wrath. Come on, say, just like, just like everyone else. Now, verse 4, everything begins to change. That was before Christ with these two words. Come on, read with me. But God. Come on, let's say it again. But God. Everything's going to change. I was dead. I was just like everybody else. Without God, without hope, with, wasn't alive. But God, who is, let's keep reading, but God, who is stingy 
angry and wanting to zap me and destroy my life and take all the joy out of me. I'm sorry, that's not what Scripture said. But God, who is what? Who is rich in what? Come on, he's rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were, even though we were what? We were dead because of our sins. He gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. God saved you by his grace when you, we got to read that sentence one more time. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for that. It is what? Come on, say it. Come on, let's say it together. It's a what? It's a gift from God. Before salvation, we are described as being what? As being dead. Dead. We might be very much physically alive, but if we take Scripture seriously, we are dead to the things of God. How does a dead person, come on, I'm just going to reason with you for those who are new, how does a dead person come alive? I mean, I don't think dead people make themselves come alive, they're dead. It must take something from the outside to cause them to come alive again. Uh, what is that something? Well, um all kind of things, but uh, I, I know some things are important. It's the, it's the teaching and preaching of the name of Jesus, but not just lifting up the name of Jesus. It also takes the Spirit of God. And when a person is saved, what is happening? The dead is coming alive. So the Spirit of God, once a person is saved and comes to Christ, the Spirit of God comes to live on the inside of someone, and they come alive to the things. They come alive to the things of God. And, and God's Spirit actually begins to change things from the, come on, everybody say real. This is real. God's Spirit begins to change things from the inside out. Um, anyone who's followed Christ, anyone who has been saved knows this to be true. Something happened on the inside and I've changed. My desires have shifted. Now I start wanting to do the things that God wants me to do. And when I don't do those things, there's this little um, feeling inside of my heart that, wait a second, something's not right. What is that feeling on the inside? Something has changed. I've encountered the Spirit of God, and His Spirit is actually alive on the inside of me. The dead has come alive. What was God doing when He sent His Son? He was sending His Son to die on the cross for our sins so that what separated us from life with God is covered in Him and we can receive newness of life in him. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians, describing this, this life that we have in Christ. 5.17 says, anyone who belongs, come on, read it with me, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a what? Come on, say new person. This is, this is, this is real. We're talking about, yes, there's fakes out there, but the real spirit of God causes us to be a, a what? A new person person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is, is, is a what? It's a gift from God that we, we simply receive who brought us back to himself. How? Through, I could share so many stories because this is what the church uh, deals with all the time is, is this word salvation, the dead coming alive. That's, that's a picture uh, of it. Um, you know, just recently we had a girl on, on stage here for our Virginia Academy Chapel, and she's a senior, and she was speaking to all her high school and middle school students, sharing her story. And uh, it began in, in, in Madagascar. Her, um, about three years ago, her mom passed away, had a battle with cancer, and lost that battle, passed away, and uh, was devastating to her. Um, Dad said, well, you, you've got a gift in basketball, and, and so let's Let's, let's move to L.A. And, and see if we can uh, find some help in basketball. So they flew out there, and, and she's doing basketball and all these things, and, and uh, it really wasn't working out. They were living in a hotel, started running out of money. He said, darling, we've we, we got to go back home. We're running out of money. This, this basketball thing isn't, doesn't seem to be taking off here. But before we go all the way back home, we'll stop in Washington, D.C., see some family and friends. So they flew into Washington, D.C., seeing some families and friends, and they hear about Virginia Academy. By the way, side note, our Virginia Academy girls basketball team, we run our fourth state championship. Come on, somebody say amen. Um, so, I mean, word's starting to get out. So, 
well, let's go see Virginia Academy. Just happened to chance come come by see Virginia Academy and, and they love what they see, love the expansion, love what's happening. And so she enrolls here and comes to one of the chapels and ends up giving her heart, listen to me, to Christ. Now we fast forward a, a couple months and now she's standing up giving her own witness. Now, if you're, if you're in law, you, you have to have witnesses, you have to have testimony, and she's giving her own testimony. She said, now, what, uh, what I could not found, find in basketball, I found in Christ. A deep depression and the pain from the loss of my mom has been healed and, 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 and lifted off to me, and I, and I have found hope, and I, and I have found strength, and, and above all that, I have found a family I've been born into a family because Jesus wasn't only just establishing salvation. He was establishing his family on the earth. And so here we are, the, the family of God, and, she, and she's sharing this. Did, did you hear what she shed, said? That Christ gave me something that uh, a deep faith. Basketball is a wonderful thing. We can, but what happens when we give ourselves to it? Some of us have been pursuing the answer in the wrong places. It can satisfy for a little bit, but it can't take the place that Christ takes when the dead come alive. It's a real coming alive in him. The old life is gone in him. This is real spiritual strength, and a new life begins in and through him, in and through, in and through him. So the dead coming alive, but it's also pictured another way. We're going to look at one more. There's many ways that salvation is pictured. Um, in John chapter 3, one, a very brilliant, the scripture says a religious man. Think of, think of him going to the, the Ivy League universities in the first century. Intelligent, religious, and uh, he comes to Jesus by night. He doesn't want to be publicly seen. He, he comes to Jesus. He, he's aware, he's smart enough to be aware that something unique is happening in Jesus. And uh, I better go talk to him and I've got some questions for him. And so he comes to Jesus, and before he can ask a question, Jesus answers a question that he should have been asking. Hello. A lot of us come in here, we come to Christ, and we've got all kinds of questions, and, and, but there's, there's critical questions that we ought to be asking. Isn't it funny how Jesus just bypasses those and gets right down? This is the real question you should be Asking. Let's, let's pick up the story. Let's read John's encounter of this. This is John 3. He says, um, Jesus said to him, this is to Nicodemus, a very intelligent man. He said, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, now stop. We're, I'm sorry. We're a thinking church. I want you to think about Jesus' words. Paul in Ephesians says, this was your life before Christ. I'm sorry. You might be very much alive, but to God, you're separated from him. You're dead in your sins. But Christ made a way where you could come alive. Here he's talking about unless you're born again. Now look at Nicodemus. He says, what in the world, verse 4, what do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again. Jesus replied, I assure you, no one, come on, everybody say no one. He said, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water. What in the world does that mean? Thank you for asking that question. I think the very next sentence answers that, being born of water and spirit. Let's keep reading. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the, the Holy Spirit gives birth. Are you with me? Are you tracking with him? In other words, flesh only produces flesh, but the Spirit produces spirit. Don't be surprised. I can see him looking at Nicodemus. He, he knew his Bible. Don't be surprised then when I say, come on, you must be by the way, Jesus isn't saying this is a nice suggestion. Well, pastor, just say something. This isn't one of Pastor Charlie's suggestions. Jesus is looking at him and saying, Nicodemus, I appreciate that you're religious. 
You know, you can be religious. I'm, I'm talking about you come to church. You can even serve. You can even give. All the outwards, it looks like, hey, this is a religious service, and yet not be born again. I know, Nicodemus, you've got a lot of questions. You want to talk about this, you want to talk about that, you want to talk about all the stuff. But let's just, let's just get down to the heart of the issue. Son, have you been born again? I, I, I don't know what you mean. And then he goes on to talk about the Spirit of God. That which is born of the flesh is just still flesh. If you've been born once, that's, that's wonderful. You've been born, that which is born of the water and the Spirit, you've been born once. But have you been born? Let me just ask you like this. What do you do with that? Let's just camp out right here. What do you do with that? Let me ask, let me ask all of us in here. Have you been born again by the Spirit of God? Without this experience, if we take Jesus seriously, without this spiritual regeneration, I've been generated once, but I need a spiritual regeneration. Without the spiritual regeneration, we cannot experience the pulsating, vigorating life of God that springs into eternal life. Life, life, life. Have you been born again? It's a real encounter with the Spirit, and it really changes us from the inside out by His Spirit. The second encounter, everyone, everyone in here can experience the real Spirit in the presence of God. Number two is not just salvation, but water baptism. What in the world? Are you serious? Water baptism? How in the world does that, how in the world does that help me? So after a person is saved, they've really given their heart to the Lord. They've repented. They've come back to God. They've, they've, they, they believe in what, they believe in how much God loves them. That he sent his own son that would die in their place for them. They receive that and they, all of a sudden they, the spirit of God comes to live on the inside and they come alive to God. What is the very next step after that, after that new birth, after being born again? If we take Scripture seriously, the very next step is to be water baptized. It's like, it's like the nurse who just receives a, 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 a newborn baby. And, and what do they do with the newborn baby? Uh, she, she or he immediately starts uh, cleaning, wiping off the am, amniotic fluid and the blood and all the other stuff that's on there. And, uh, was, you know. We're going, to, we're going to clean up a little bit. Come on, everybody say clean up. And that, and that next step, come on, say next step. Next step after the new birth is that water baptism. Jesus himself was baptized, and every account in the Scripture of a follower of Christ went into the waters of, of, of baptism. You say, well, what's the big deal? Why? Now, we're going to read a passage of Scripture, but let me give you a little context. Just like a lot of the passages of Scripture, the audience had a deep Jewish understanding. That's not so today. Sometimes we can read a Scripture and you're like, what in the world is that talking about? Uh, the audience understood what circumcision was in the Old Testament in ancient Israel. Circumcision was a sign of their covenant agreement with God. We are the people of God. On the eighth day, the, script, the law said every male child shall be circumcised, and that will be a sign of the agreement of the covenant that you have with me. But what happens when Jesus comes on the scene? Now this is no longer about ancient Israel, about one nation, but Jesus comes as the Savior uh, of not one nation, but he comes as the Savior of every ethnicity of the entire globe, of the entire world. What would be the new circumcision? Jesus said the new circumcision is a circumcision not of the physical body, but a circumcision of the, of the heart. Listen, this is real. This is not fake. A real circumcision, a cutting away of my old self and the replacement of a new heart before God. And the sign of that circumcision, it, in the Old Testament it was physical, but in the new it was spiritual and how that happened was in the waters, are you with me? In the waters of baptism. Now, with that thought, 
Let's pick up the scripture. Now we're in Colossians 2 and 11. Read with me if you would. It says, in union with Christ, you were what? You were circumcised. Not with circumcision that is made by human beings, but with the circumcision. Now stop right there. Imagine, imagine a Jewish audience saying, you, you know how big of a deal the physical circumcision was? It's everything. And now you have a, a, a new thing happening where we're saying that what is everything is the circumcision of the heart by the Spirit of God. And you're going, what? The circumcision, not with the circumcision that is made by human beings, keep reading with me, but with the circumcision made by Christ, which consists of being freed from the power of how is that happening? My heart is being circumcised. Look at verse 12 and look at the connection here. Say, for when you were, you got to stop reading. You just, you just like, I know this is a tricky pastor. He's leading me somewhere. I don't want to go, but I want, you, I want you to read the scriptures here. For when you were what? For when you were, that circumcision is connected with baptism. And I, it doesn't say if you were baptized. If you want to be freed from the power, the real cut in the heart, the root of the power of that old person to be cut, it happens when you were, let's read, when you were baptized, you were what? You were buried with Christ. And in baptism, you were also raised with Christ. Important phrase here, through your what? Through your faith in the active. Come on, everybody say active. We're talking about experiencing the real. Through your faith in what? The active power of God who raised the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead can reside in our hearts as well. So when we're baptized, What's happening? Well, some of us have been taught that baptism is just merely a symbol. Just something you do, and because it was a symbol, you did not receive the power that's available to you. Come on, everybody say real. Experiencing the real power of God. When I get into the waters of baptism, it says through faith in the, in, in the, in the what? In the active power power of God. Some of us have gotten baptized, but you didn't have faith in Christ in the active power of God, and all we did was get wet. And so when you hear something like this, you're going, well, yeah, but, but it's, it's not really real. It is real. Maybe you encountered a deep fake, and the Spirit of God is here saying, hey, there are some real experiences in Christ that you can experience. And the one is the very dead of who we are in our soul can come alive to God in Christ. And then the power of, of the sinful nature itself can be forever cut in my heart through circumcision, through the waters of baptism, in faith, in the active power of God. I had a person come up to me, a wonderful person, wonderful Christian. Pastor, I'm... Pray for me, I'm struggling with this, struggling with that. It just, it just naturally came out of me. I said, well, have you been baptized? Oh, no. no uh, why would I get baptized? I mean, that's a real question. Let's talk about it. What's the big deal about baptism? The big deal is the very power of God. The active power of God at work in our lives, and it's available. Come on, everybody say next step. Next step. Lord, I, some of us are struggling to live an overcoming life because we still haven't buried the old man. And we really haven't been resurrected in Christ as well. And I can sense the Spirit. I could just stop right. I can sense the Spirit of God tugging on something. When, when, when you feel the Spirit of God drawing you, He's trying to draw you to something better. Always. He's such a loving Father. Just 
growing in me. We had a um, um, an Iranian couple who um, came to the church, got drawn to the Lord in a thing, uh, drawn to the Lord and convicted about baptism. And uh, by the way, let me just say, in, in a lot of foreign countries, baptism is a big deal. Not so much in the successful commercial American church. Where we, you know, consumer Christianity, we pick and choose the things we want and not the things we don't. Anyway, they baptism for them is a big deal because in Iran... The government there recognizes when you're baptism, when you're baptized, you can have your little private confession. But Christianity doesn't stop at a private confession. The next step, come on, say next step. You ever notice you can't get baptized by yourself? Take somebody else. It's public. But the government there recognizes when you're baptized, you're burying your history. And we're not going to stand for that. We'll put you in prison or, or other things. So a sweet little couple here got baptized, and then we, we had to take them to the State Department and get uh, a religious exemption. And thank God they were able to get that. Amen? In baptism, Lord, I'm, I'm not just crossing the line, but there's a, there's a supernatural work by faith in you of what's happening in my life. What's the big deal in your notes? What's the big deal about baptism? When water baptism, come on, read with me if you would. When water baptism is done through faith in Christ, God's power, it cuts away the root. Come on, say the root. Now, I'm not just, I'm not just pulling fruit down and it's just being replaced. No, I'm, I'm getting at the root of my old life. The scripture says that sinful nature and it frees me to live the new life that God's calling me. It opens the door to victorious, to victorious living. Yes, I still have enemies. Yes, I still have temptations. Yes, I still walk with these. But listen to me. I'm resisting and I'm prevailing over them from a, from a different vantage point. I'm not only really saved, but I'm water baptized. Buried and resurrected. In and through Christ. Third experience. This is unbelievable. It just gets better and better. Third experience. You can really, by the way, some of us have been trying to overcome some things and you're, you're unbaptized. And there's a real experience with the Spirit of God and the active belief in what Christ has done and His active power that can be experienced in water baptism. But it doesn't end there. Um, this third experience offered to anybody, any of us, is what the Scripture calls, it's called some different things, but most of the times it's called baptism in or with the Holy Spirit. That's the third experience available to anybody. Baptism in the Holy Spirit. What in the world does that mean? Where does that come from? First of all, that phrase is, is very biblical. It's, it's everywhere in Scripture. So we have to deal with it. I'm going to give you a couple of examples, okay? This is John the Baptist. John the Baptist is, is, is the forerunner to Jesus. He's baptizing people. Look what he says. John says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is what? Is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He, we're talking about Jesus, he will what? So we look at baptism in the Holy Spirit as a ministry that Jesus wants to do. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now let's fast forward. There's, there's a lot of other examples, but let's fast forward. Now Jesus' death, a resurrection, burials behind him, and he's hanging out for 40 days with his disciples before his ascension. And uh, we're going to pick it up. This is what he's telling his followers. This is Acts 1.5. He says, John truly baptized with water. But you shall be what? Baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to tell you these next two verses 
I'm going to speed read. So you got to go fast with me, okay? Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it's not to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Now let's pick it up, verse 8. But, it's a key verse, but, but you shall receive what? Power. When what happens? But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, upon you, and you shall be my witness, goes on. So in your notes, what in the world does this baptism with the Holy Spirit mean? I know what it means, Pastor Charlie. It means that you and the rest of this church, a little weird, a little strange, uh, most likely a little emotionally uh, unstable, uh, insecure, gullible for certain, uh, cuckoo, what's happening right now? We're talking about baptism? No, 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 I'm sorry, but this is a thinking church. Are you here? What does it mean? Jesus wants to do it. John the Baptist talked about it. His followers all experience. This, this baptism in the Holy Spirit, what does it mean? It means, in your notes, it means to be filled. Come on, say filled. Filled with the noticeable. Come on, say noticeable. I, I can't deny it. My, 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 my wife sees it. My, my, the people closest to me around acknowledge it. The noticeable strength and help of God, of the Spirit of God. Now, this is not just a one-time event. This is, some time, this is something that a, a saved and baptized believer can experience over and over in their lives. What is it? When the Holy Spirit comes upon a person, they move, here it is, they move from just living and serving according to their own ability, wisdom, and strength, and know-how to living with the real, everyone say real, the real noticeable help of God. What are you talking about? There's an unseen hand on my life, the, the helping hand of God, my quality of my work, come on, say my work, my work, my results, my life is, is, is higher, there's a supernatural touch on me, I, I'm, I'm living with an advantage that not everybody else lives with. Look how Jesus said it. This is what Jesus, speaking of the Spirit of God, he said, I tell you the truth, talking to his followers, I tell you the truth, it is to your, to your what? To your what? It is to your advantage that I, can you imagine them? No, no, Lord, it's better if you stay right here next to us. I'm serious. You're doing all these miracles, you're doing all these things, you're, you're bringing people back to God, what are you talking about? It's to our disadvantage if you disappear. Jesus flips it on his head. He said, it's to your advantage that I go away. Well, what do you mean by that? Look what he said. If, for if I do not go away, what's his name? Come on, what's the Spirit's name? The helper will not come to you, but if I go, another word for that is I will baptize you. Come on. John said he will baptize you. with it. I will send the helper to you. Does anyone need the help? Let's back up. Does anybody really want the help of God? I, I was thinking of uh, James Lawson's book, Deeper Experiences. Uh, first of all, I love that. Come on, say that with me. Deeper, ex deeper Experiences of Famous Christians. He starts with the Old Testament, goes to the New Testament, and goes to the apostolic time period all the way up to about the turn of the 19th century, tracing uh, very famous Christians and their experiences with the Spirit of God. Here's was his, let me just wrap it up. Here's was his conclusion. It didn't matter if they were male or female. It didn't matter their background, ethnicity. It didn't matter their denomination. If they were Quaker, Methodist, Baptist, uh, Catholic, um, uh, Greek Orthodox, on and on and on. There's too many of them. It didn't matter. They called it different things, but they all agreed on this. This is the testimony of, of Christians for generations. The testimony is, is that you can receive power and strength from the Spirit of God. 
what we just read, the baptism of the Spirit of, of God. In fact, he said that the usual, the usual order in the early church was first salvation. Everything starts there. I, I, I'm saved, my sins are forgiven, and then I step into what? The usual order was water baptism. And then the very next thing that was on the, the follower of Christ experience was the laying on of hands for them to be filled with the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit. In fact, let's, let's read just a, a quote from, from uh, Dr. Lawson. He says, the early Christian church, read it with me if you would, the early Christian church believed in and prayed for the filling of the Holy Spirit. And this was, let's stop there. You know the challenges, and we've been praying this whole series, is that we would encounter the real, the real Spirit of God. There are a lot of young people, high school, middle school, college students, really a lot of us, but especially I believe that generation is crying out for the real. And then they come to church and they don't experience it. And so they go looking for it elsewhere. Come on, let's just, let's just, let's just pray just right here. Lord, I pray that this house... In fact, Lord, we just pray for your church at large. Lord, may this be a place where people encounter the noticeable, altering, liberating, clarifying, lifting, bondage-breaking, freeing, real freeing power. the Spirit of God in Christ. In Jesus' name. I can see Jesus. Not, not only do I want to, listen to me, not only do I want to forgive you of your sins by the power of my Spirit and what I've already done for you, it's a free gift. but I want to baptize you and wash you. And I want to forever cut the root and put you in a place where you have the, at least the chance of being everything I've called you to be. And then on top of all that, I want to pour out my strength. My help. I want you to live. I want you to serve me with an advantage. I want that marriage to have an advantage over me. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. You know, James, at the... When he gets all said and done, he said the encounter with the, the real power and strength of God, it's not just for superstar Christians. I know some of you, it's hard to believe. It's too good to be true. I know, that's why it's called good news. It's for anyone who thirsts and who hungers after God. It's for the teacher in the classroom, the executive, the lawyer, homemaker. Someone, you need the power and the help of God to turn that home that's full of strife. And the Holy Spirit wants you to help turn that home to a haven of peace. For the consultant, the web designer, the account manager, the architect, the scientist, the pilot, the engineer, the college student, Lord, I can live with the, the divine help 
of God. We're going we're gonna, to, let's, let's close. I, I, I sense the, the presence of the Lord here right now. I just, let's not go any further. Would you close your, close your notes. Your, turn your, if you have any other app open right now, just, just turn it off. If your friend has another app on, you turn it off for him. Come on, say, come on. Something good's getting ready to happen. Something good. Praise the Lord. Come on, let's, let's put your hands out like this. Some of us in here, you've tried all kinds of things. But you've not really drunk in spirit in the presence of God. Lord, there's someone under the sound of my voice, they're far from you. And you're drawing them in their heart. They need to be born again. That's really the root problem. Is I, I've, I've never been spiritually transformed. I need to come home to you. Lord, there's others of us in here who Lord, need to take that next step. Lord, there's others of us in here, God, who need a fresh touch. Lord, to be filled with the strength and the help the noticeable help of God. So, Lord, we open up our hands to you. Lord, help us to receive what has been freely purchased and offered to us, God. Help us to open up to it. Lord, may today be, be a breakthrough day for, for many of us. Lord, a, a, a turning of a corner, God new experience of, of the freedom and, and the help of God. I thank you for it. In Jesus' name. It's in your name that we pray. All of us said, come on.